All right, <clears throat> cool. So, hello. My name is Matt Seneschal. Uh, I uh, work for Tempered Networks. I've been in uh, the industrial uh, system space only for about two and a half years. When I started in this organization, the first time someone said PLC or HMI to me, I had no idea what they were talking about. Um, but I've been in cybersecurity since about 1999. Um, so I've just had this inquisitive mind about this world and didn't know a lot about uh, uh, industrial control systems or, um, or, uh, or this market at all, um, or its relevance in general to IT and how those systems were connected. Um, so what I have a really fun job. I'm going to uh, teach you guys something new, something that you have uh, likely never heard of. Uh, before, um, and uh, as I've, I mentioned before, we're a Seattle-based local company. Um, so from an agenda standpoint, um, we're just gonna kind of talk about what is security, uh, why attack industrial control systems, and that seems, uh, uh, you know, uh, a popular thing these days. Uh, I'll give you guys the history of our company. Um, what is HIP? We're gonna answer that question if you're not familiar with it. Uh, uh, and, uh, and introduce you guys to this idea of, of cryptographic identity networking. Uh, we'll then talk about uh, uh, this overall concept called cloaking, which was originally developed by the US military. Um, and then a brand new technology that we just released about two weeks ago. Um, uh, and then we'll talk about how to learn more as we go through this. Following this, if you have any questions, obviously email me um, or send me, a, give me a call and we'll go through it. So, Let's just talk about what is security. Um, so security means a lot of things to a lot of different people and it can kind of get lost. And, and really all security is, is lowering risk. That's all it is. It's not, there's no sort of, um, you know, a checkbox. You go, okay, we have security now. It is just the continually lowering of risk. And the thing that's really important to understand is it's not a product. You can't go out and buy security. Uh, it's a process. It will always be a process until the end of time. Um, you identify risk, you implement controls, you assess that, and then you keep going forever and ever. This is just the way the world works, right? When you buy a lock for your house, you still need smoke alarms, right? So you can't just buy one thing and then say, okay, we have security. Same thing goes for technology. So uh, in the last, and the reason that I think uh, you guys are here and, and, a, and a lot of what's going on in the world right now is in the last 12 months, 54% of companies experienced an industrial control security breach of some sort. Um, and this came from a, a Kaspersky report that came out just uh, last week. Um, so in, in cybersecurity incidents, ICS, in an ICS environment, the hack can cost lives. This is, you know, there's a saying out there, right? In IT, when things get hacked, people lose money. In OT, when things get hacked, people die. It's a scary statement to make, but it, is, it can be a very true statement. Um, uh, you know, they can have a long-lasting impact on the environment. Um, you can attract, obviously, fines from regulators and, and partners, right, who have been put at risk, because a lot of people don't realize that once someone hacks you, they're also hacking everybody that's connected to you. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, result in the loss of a product or service, uh, you know, as a result of the breach. And then companies can close down completely. We'll see in the next 24 months, you're going to see companies that were here today be gone as a result of a massive cybersecurity incident. Um, that's just. My prediction, but we'll see if it's true, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. So the big question is, why attack industrial control systems? Because in the past, right, people attacked systems to get information, and then they would take that information and use it against you. Uh, uh, you know, they'd hack your, your uh, social security number, they'd hack your medical information, they'd hack your bank information, and they have a conglomerate everything about you, and now they can go open up credit cards in your name. So there was a very easy to understand process. But the big question is, is why attack industrial control systems? Uh, and it's really simple. It's, there's a lot of money in it. There's just an unbelievable amount of money in it. If I say, uh, uh, you know, in order to get your city back online, you've got to pay me a million dollars, you're going to pay me a million dollars because your city's going to be shut down. Uh, and, and these guys know it. So, so why is specifically industrial control systems at, at, at risk? So number one is that people make mistakes. We're all humans. We all 
uh, you know, make mistakes all the time, and everything in technology was written by humans. Uh, a recent story I can share with you guys. Um, there's a local energy company, pretty big name around here, uh, and uh, one of their um, SCADA engineers got in his truck and did his hour and a half drive out to a remote site to go update some PLCs. When he arrived, he opened his laptop and noticed he had 10% battery and did not have his power cord with him. But he had his smartphone and his personal laptop that was full of juice. So he used that to go out to the internet, download the software for the, industrial con or for the, uh, for the uh, PLCs, and updated the PLCs. And he came back to the office and bragged how he just saved himself an hour and a half trip. And his security people went nuts. But again, these are people. People do these kind of things, and, and they can bypass. They bypassed every security protocol that he had with, uh, you know, a smartphone and a computer, which pretty much everybody has. Um, software is very complicated. Uh, there's no really way for me to say this without, uh, uh, or you know, put this in any words except it's extremely complicated. Uh, this is the closest uh, I've ever worked with a development team. Um, and under the hood, I can tell you every piece of software that's written out there is extremely complicated. Um, uh, thousands, if not millions, of vulnerabilities have yet to be discovered, um, at least by us. Now, the NSA might have discovered some of these. We've seen the shadow brokers and some of these guys going out and taking some of these new discoveries and uh, you know, selling them to, uh, to, to various people to go do bad things. But um, we continue to find back doors and things we didn't know about. Um, everything in IT is always changing. This is sort of the problem that we have in industrial systems is in an IT environment, the world is constantly changing and constantly evolving. Um, so whatever is true today may not be true tomorrow. Um, and, and this is really true. Uh, most companies that we're seeing right now have a very hardened perimeter, but once I'm inside, I can do anything I want. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, a large uh, manufacturer based somewhere here in the Northwest uh, invited us in to do some proof of concept work for them. Uh, as we were setting up stuff, my engineer asked, from that wall jack, can I ping your PLCs? And he kind of smiled and said, you can. In fact, you can ping every PLC at every one of our locations. They have 169 locations, all set up through MPLS. From the wall jack in the conference room, I could literally hit every single one of their industrial control systems. They set up the biggest layer two flat network I've ever seen. Um, and it was uh, uh, you know, just completely wide open. Yet, to get out to the internet was a massive challenge to do anything. They had all this hardened perimeter, but once you were in the inside of the beast, you could go anywhere. And this is true, we see this all over the place. Um, this is just, that's just a really kind of a, a big example. Um, in a TCP IP world, there is no such thing as identity. And we're gonna get more into this, but this makes things really challenging because you and every other company in the world have built systems based on address schemes that are absolutely spoofable. There's no such thing as identity in a TCP IP world. Anybody can be anybody, and that's really challenging um, from a security perspective. Um, uh, air gap networks are a myth. Um, we continue to see this. Uh, this was the way that the world, hey, we'll just get to air gap these d devices. They'll never get out to the internet, but everything that you run runs software. Um, everybody has a smartphone. Uh, I was at a, a, a industrial control system conference recently, and one of the major vendors bragged about their new uh, Bluetooth capabilities in their PLCs. I mean, it, it, <laughs> it makes your head go kapoof, like, you know, uh, but so, um, yeah, this idea that, uh, uh, you know, people can air gap is true. And, and, and criminals are becoming much smarter and more organized. There's just way too much money in this. We saw this with WannaCry. We're going to continue to see this with, with hacks that are coming out. Um, and there's just, it's organized crime at a very big level. Um, and, and, and hacking is continuing to evolve, right? And, and the latest one we've seen is ransomware. Um, and, and why is ransomware popular? Because it's really easy to come up with this process and basically, I'm not hacking you, I'm hacking the world. You are just going to get hacked if I am lucky enough and if I'm lucky enough, you're gonna give me money, right? So what, here's what happens, a new exploit is discovered, uh, hacking groups write some software based on that new exploit, 
Um, they, 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 they kind of test it in a small area to see if this works. Yep, this did exactly uh, as, as we thought it would work. And then they send it out using peer-to-peer -peer technology. So things like torrents and things will spread this into the wild. And then they just sit back and wait. And a percentage of the victims will pay the ransom. So it's incredibly lucrative. What we saw with WannaCry was literally a toe dipped in the water, just a fist of the very first of what we've seen. And we just saw, uh, it was either this week or last week, that Honda shut down several plants because they got hit with WannaCry. Um, there, was a, some, there was a story I was reading today in Australia where all the traffic lights were completely locked up in, in a town in, in Australia because they were hit with ransomware. Um, so, so this is this is going this is just going to be the new way because it's people say well why would they want to hack me right I'm a small water district or I'm a small manufacturer what why would any it's not has nothing to do with you this is just you know literally shotgun blasting the world and finding out who's going to pay them money. So <laughs> when I did this uh, similar very, very similar presentation up in Anchorage a few weeks ago the day before I did it I was on. Uh, Twitter and, and, and found this picture that someone had posted. That is someone's washing machine uh, in Germany uh, uh, that was now locked up using ransomware. Um, it's funny, right? It is, but it, it, it shows you what's about to happen, right? This is the way that you're, all the stuff that we now get for our homes, our businesses, our IoT enabled. Um, I just uh, had uh, met with a, a customer who recently found out that all the coffee machines on their network uh, were now connected to uh, their network. The, that that uh, the, the new vendor came in, asked the lady at the front desk, hey, can I have the Wi-Fi password? Sure, here it is. And then they set all their coffee machines up on their network so that when they started running low on supplies, the, 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 the supplier could come in and deliver these things. Um, this is where things are, ha are going. Uh, I read a recent report saying within 10 years, everything that we plug in will be IoT enabled, everything. Because if, we, if it's got energy in it, it's just so easy to get it connected to a network. And then there's all these benefits, but there's downsides as well. Um, and so the, the good question is, right, is ransomware coming to industrial control systems, right? Um, so I just pulled some headlines, you know, pretty recently. Cider Electric is still shipping passwords and firmware. Uh, malware disguised as Siemens software drills into 10 industrial plants. Uh, I don't know if you guys ever heard about uh, Energetic Bear, but it was an uh, attack that was done on the Siemens system where they basically did a redirect on Siemens website so that people, as they started downloading uh, new firmware P uh, for their PLCs, would ship them malware, uh, of course, thinking they were downloading it from Siemens. Um, amazingly insecure industrial control systems, Plus internet equals a cup full of nope. And then right there, meet Bitlocker, the Botfin built SCADA ransomware. That is from February of this year. Uh, so the, we've already done this in a lab. If you read this report, you can find out, well, they just did it in Georgia Tech to prove that it could be done because almost all the PLCs these days have some sort of web service on it. So they just wanted to prove that, yes, can you run ransomware on a PLC? Absolutely, and uh, they did this, and this was before WannaCry or any of these big ransomware, uh, you know, things started happening. So now we get into the fun stuff. I just kind of had to preload this with like, hey, let's talk about some stuff, get you guys a little heads thinking about, okay, what, what are we talking about here? So I'm going to give you guys a history of this technology, um, and, uh, and, and I would just write down the questions because you're going to have a lot, and then at the end we can sort of sit and talk through these. Um, so this funny looking gentleman here, his name is David Mattis. He lives in Ballard. He uh, uh, worked for the uh, he worked for a um, local uh, aerospace company. <laughs> I'll let you take a guess at which one. Uh, and, uh, and 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 Mattis was uh, a data scientist. And um, uh, in 2001, he had a summit in Renton uh, where they brought all the data scientists from all over the world uh, that, that worked for this aerospace company to talk about this protocol, TCP IP. And the big thing they wanted to talk about was can we trust this protocol? You know, not is it reliable, but fundamentally can we trust it? And here's what was happening in 2000, and uh, I'm guessing a lot of you guys uh, were around then, is that uh, all of the systems started showing up with Ethernet. Now, I recently had a meeting with a gentleman at a large um, company here in Seattle that used to be famous for selling books. 
they sell lots of things now. And he let me know that in right around this time, that what happened was is the industrial systems people just started saying, the cereal's expensive. It's expensive to run, it's inefficient. Um, we can just go to Ethernet because Ethernet's now become the commodity. Right, uh, price of Ethernet started going like this. Price of uh, 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 you know all the systems, and people wanted the convenience of being able to use IT skills to start networking things. We didn't think about the downsides. I don't think. I think everyone just kind of jumped into this boat, saying, "Well, this is the way the world's going." But not only does this affect things like industrial control systems, but medical devices. I met with the uh, chief information security officer for Providence recently. Providence has MRI machines, and the way that they do security on them is five minutes before you walk in, they plug it in. Then when you leave, they unplug the, the network connection because all of their machines run XP. This is how they have to do internet security in today's age. There's no way to protect that machine. You can't patch it. So this in system, not only did it go into industrial control systems, but medical and all these other systems that really should have been completely separate from the underlying network that we're running on for the World Wide Web. So um, at this aerospace company, they had made this hard decision to go towards robotics and IP tooling as a way to compete internationally. And they basically had to have systems that didn't have 401k plans and kids soccer games to attend to be able to compete. Um, but these systems all run SCADA. And just like every other SCADA system, if it was hacked, you'd have no idea. Um, and they call themselves the World Cup of Corporate Espionage. Literally everybody's trying to hack in there all the time. They have to operate under those, that kind of thought pattern. Um, and. Uh, and so they had, to put a, uh, they had to figure out a way to protect systems that had no way to protect themselves. Um, and, and, and the downside, and, and you know, in, in this world, if this, these systems were hacked, it was not only a safety issue, but a quality issue, and both were catastrophic. So the board was really pushing to figure out how to, how to, how to secure all this stuff. Um, and, and so what, one of the big things that came out of this conference that this aerospace company sort of jumped in onto was that IP addresses should not function as identity. And of course, in a networking world, in today's world, that is how you identify a host on a network. You write your firewall rules for that. You set up your VLANs that way. Everything you do is based on an IP address, which is easily spoofable. Um, and so, to secure, and the other thing in a TCP IP world is if I plug something into a TCP IP network, it just starts talking to anything. It has no concept of trust, it has no, it just starts communicating immediately. So to protect these things, you've got to write really complex firewall rules, you have to write ACLs on all of your routers, you have to put VLANs everywhere, um, you have to have really complex VPNs, and what happened was they sort of figured out over time that this equaled complexity, and complexity really meant two things. One, getting anything on these networks was going to take a very long time. It was about a seven week process when they first got started doing this. Uh, seven weeks to write all these rules, but then have someone go box by box configuration once they were written, and then an auditor to go through to make sure someone didn't screw it up. Because if you fat finger one of these rules, you can screw, you know, you can connect two networks or do something horrible. Um, so complexity was starting to kill their business, and, and they sort of had these issues that we were working through. So um, one of the guys who kind of talks about this stuff a lot is the, the author of TCP IP. He's a guy that's not thought of very much. He works for Google now. His name is Vince Cerf. Um, and Vince, in 1977, um, you know, finalized TCP IP and kind of released it in the wild to replace ARPANET. Um, and in 2009, he did an interview for Google where people just got to ask questions. And one of the questions was, if you could go back and change things, what would you change? Um, and he said, if I could start over again, I would have introduced a lot more strong authentication and cryptography into the system. Now, he went on to say later, in, a, in several interviews uh, since then, that he had the, that uh, design, but that at the time, cryptography was owned by the federal government and the NSA. And they were like saying, no, this is ours. You can go have this. We're going to keep this for military operations. 
Um, so uh, had he introduced this, I wouldn't be having to speak with you. We probably wouldn't be hit dealing with 99% of the hacks that are happening right now. But uh, anyway, that, this is the way the world works, right? So, um, so you know, Vince really had this sort of mindset that, you know, hey, I've built this thing. This animal's now released, but you know, uh, boy, if I could do it over again, there's things I would have done differently. So, so the question, <laughs> uh, the question is, what is hip? Um, it is a Tower of Power song, uh, if you're not familiar. It's a very cool one. Um, but it's also the host identity protocol. Um, the host identity protocol, this uh, book by uh, uh, Andre Gudroff, I think is how you spell his name, uh, is on the internet for free. So if you Google host identity protocol uh, book, I think it'll just come right up. It's on, on Google as a PDF. It's boring. You'll fall asleep reading it. If you don't, then you read RFCs all the time, and you love that kind of stuff. Uh, it is very deep, very technical, but uh, there's books out there written. Um, so, so HIP fixes this fundamental problem that you have in TCP IP. Basically, moving from a world where uh, we, we, we uh, assign um, uh, both the location and the uh, uh, identity of a device by its IP address, and separating that and adding a low, an identifier, and we, this is called host identity. Host identity protocol was co-authored by the US military in 1999 to fix this fundamental problem by introducing a public-private key pair that sits in between layers three and four of the OSI stack. They call it layer 3.5. So the protocol itself is very interesting. One, if you try to open a TCP IP connection to a device that speaks HIP, it will not acknowledge you. It has no way to communicate with you. It just goes, mm, I have no idea what you're saying. If you know that device speaks HIP and you download a version of OpenHIP, because as of 2014, HIP is now an open standard, the exact same thing happens. HIP, by its very nature, is only listening and responding to whitelisted trusted cryptographic identities and nothing else. So unless your cryptographic identity has been whitelisted to talk to that device or that port, the port has no way to communicate with you. So this is very fundamentally different than TCP IP. Um, and every branch of the US military started deploying this to replace TAC lanes uh, starting in about 2003, 2004 timeframe. Um, so the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the, you know, most of the department, the DOD and the NSA have built these large scale HIP networks. So Boeing got view into that and they decided, well, geez, this is sort of where we want to take this. Um, and uh, so the original plan was to kind of force the vendors to say, hey, you guys want to do business with us as an aerospace company, you've got to go adopt this protocol. Um, and everybody came back and said no, because when they were asking this, this was uh, you know, kind of mid-2000s, nobody had uh, uh, deployed this except for the military, um, and, uh, and, and it was still an experimental protocol. So um, to kind of give you a little bit more of a clear idea of what this is doing, basically we add a tag to every packet that's sent that says this is this, and it, is, uh, it, it follows everything that everyone does. So in a world where hacking is prevalent, this would be really helpful because we would know for 100% certainty it was Jimmy in Alabama that hacked that server. We would know it. Um, uh, so HIP helps with that, but it also just helps with this whole identity problem. Um, so so uh, the original uh, sort of thought when that, uh, the, the vendors came back and said, no, we're not, we're not going to adopt this. Um, was to basically say, well, we're not going to change the world, we'll change ourselves, and, and we will invent a device that will take TCP IP and convert to HIP, and HIP to TCP IP. And they called it a HIP switch. Um, HIP switches are really straightforward. Uh, they have two sides. Um, this one happens to have two ports, so it's really easy. Uh, the bottom port uh, uh, or port two here speaks TCP IP. You plug your machine into that. Um, the top port speaks host identity protocol. In a host identity protocol world, all communication is encrypted. Uh, so uh, we use uh, for our purposes something called um, AES-256 encryption with something called perfect forward secrecy to add just a little more security on top of that. Um, but when you plug in machine A into this, this could be a PLC um, or any sort of device, it could be anything really, um, it no longer exists. 
Meaning if I scan your network and said, show me all IPs, you can't see it. If I'm sitting on the same subnet as this device and I try to ping that device, I can't. Um, the only thing that's going to be able to communicate with it, if you haven't quite figured this out, is whitelisted trusted cryptographic identities. So it allows you to say who can talk to who. Um, and in a SCADO application, typically these little uh, HIP switches were, are put in on a per cabinet basis. So every in, uh, cabinet uh, gets one of these and the switch that's in that cabinet gets plugged into this. This becomes the gateway out to the network and then from the network. So now that whole SCADA cabinet now just doesn't exist. The military, US military calls this cloaking, meaning it's there but you can't see it, right? This is how we do things like launch controls and drone communication and satellite stuff so that it is completely isolated sort of from that underlying network from a communication standpoint. Because even if you get in the middle of this, right, if I just sit right here, all I'm gonna see is encrypted traffic. There's nothing to see, it's just encrypted traffic getting passed around. So <clears throat> HIP switches, um, um, by their very nature, do a few different things. Uh, they can do layer three, so I can have things on separate subnets communicate to each other and the HIP switch becomes the router. I can do layer two, so I can have things on the same subnet and they're just gonna arc between each other regardless of location. So these two HIP switches could be, or three HIP switches could be anywhere in the world and they would just communicate, it would all look like it's right next door. Um, and they can do something called network address translation, or NAT. So I can have devices with the same IP addresses communicate to each other. The HIP switches will then just NAT to say dot .13, or these highlighted yellow ones. Um, the hardest part though for people to wrap their head around is, is this idea of the underlay and the overlay. So the underlay is the network that these devices ride on. Uh, in this example, this 172.16.0.0 network. Um, in this, on, on these networks, uh, uh, all the, uh, the network sees is the outside IP address that you give the HIP switch and encrypted traffic. That's it. So everything in the overlay network disappears. It just doesn't exist. So you can use public internet, you can use cellular, you can use Wi-Fi. We have people in Alaska that are running this over microwave links um, out in the open on public networks because the underlying network will never see this communication. It just sees encrypted traffic getting passed around between the HIP switches. Um, and so, um, so this is kind of the hardest part for people to grasp onto because it's so different than traditional networking. Uh, so <clears throat> once, uh, when uh, this aerospace company started doing this at sort of some sort of scale, it became very hard to manage because uh, on, a, uh, uh, you know, on a small scale, it's pretty easy. But in a large scale, uh, every, especially in the early days, this was all command line driven. So if I had to do a change on where this routes to or how this communicates, or what its policy was, you know, someone in IT had to come in and write these commands. So, so they invented something called the conductor. Um, and the conductor became the orchestration engine that manages all, managed all the HIP switches and HIP services across the organization. Um, HIP switches come in lots of shapes and sizes, we'll go through that in a minute, but you can run this as, as, as clients, you can run these as virtual, you, these can go up in the cloud, um, and all of the policy is pushed from this single plane of glass called the conductor, so that the local operator had no way to configure these devices. All they, had to, all they knew is that this was like some encryption device that would kind of hide things, but locally you couldn't set policy, you couldn't even do any troubleshooting. Everything came from one spot. Over time, this evolved from IT wanting to control this to IT realizing if we give people the tools and the proper training, they can control their own world. And so the conductor became this way for non-technical people to be able to build private networks and do it in a way where they can't screw it up and do it in a way that would satisfy all the security requirements they had. Um, and, uh, and, and so uh, what happened is um, they started making it so that anybody could do this. Uh, our threshold is Gmail. If you can use Gmail, you can build private networks because you're not doing anything that says 
Um, you know, well, this IP can talk to, you're literally just going, this can talk to this. These things can talk to these things. And it builds the network. You don't have to know anything about routing or switching or firewall rules or ACLs or VLANs or any of the sort of magic complexity of networking to do this. You just say these things can talk to these things. The conductor does all the back end, you know, uh, work through software to make all those connections happen. Uh, so this became a standard within the company. And sometime in 2014, they sort of sat up and realized, we're not a networking company. So these guys left. They started a company called Asgard Networks, um, the, the original sort of five people uh, that we, were, were building this. Um, and they were successful for two years. And, and their primary customer was this aerospace company and other sort of subsidiaries of this company. Uh, and then they ran into a guy named Jeff Husey. Jeff started F5 Networks, a local tech company. Um, he retired in 08. Um, and uh, saw this in, in 2013 and said, this is going to change the world. Because this, is his words, um, is not a vitamin, it's the vaccine. Right? In security, a lot of times what we're doing is saying, um, hey, you've been hacked. You should deal with this. Right? I got data to prove that you were hacked. Or I'm looking for some sort of signature. Hopefully, I have that signature to know that, hey, this thing that's communicating is, is about to be hacked. Um, this, hides things. This is, this is uh, as pure as it gets. It just, the, the devices that are sitting behind our uh, uh, technology just don't exist on the underlying network. Um, so um, what happened within this aerospace company um, as we took what used to take them eight weeks down to, or seven weeks down to a day. Because there's massive efficiencies when you don't deal with traditional networking. When you're not dealing with firewalls and ACLs and VLANs and box-by-box -box configuration, especially in a bigger organization, you can get really efficient about this new device shows up, I plug it into a hip switch, I give it its policy, and I go back to work. Um, and, but the number one reason that we're sort of growing as fast as we are as a company and that you know, this technology is sort of taking off is that we can take entire network segments and cloak them. You cannot see it, you cannot ping it. If I'm that user on that network, that network just doesn't exist to me. So there's always this talk about IT and OT and the separation of the lines between. This is the line, right? There is no accidental sort of spill over. Doesn't mean you can't screw it up from a policy perspective. You could certainly let somebody into this network that shouldn't be. But as long as you control those policies, this is certainly raises the bar really, really high. So we do this on a variety of hardware. That's on the left. Um, our smallest device runs 12 megabits a second. It's about the size of a deck of cards. Our largest device is uh, closer to four gigs um, and, uh, and does, has up to 16 ports on it, and so it's data center grade. Uh, last year, though, was the first year we sold more software than hardware. We now run this in every hypervisor, so VMware, Hyper-V, Zen, and KVM. We're now running this in Amazon, in Azure, in Rackspace, and in Google as a way to get information in and out of cloud environments in a safe manner. Um, we do this as a client in Windows, in Mac, and in iOS. And the way that would work, I would send Brian a download. Brian would download the software. I would see a new authentication request in the conductor. And I would say, Brian, you now have a cryptographic identity. And now you can talk to this server, and it would build a private network from Brian's machine to that server via a split tunnel that speaks HIP off of his TCP IP laptop. So now Brian has a cryptographic identity and a way to participate in HIP networks without plugging into a HIP switch. Um, we also do this as a, as a license on servers. So you can take a Windows server, load an agent, and now have it speak HIP. Uh, either through a split tunnel or we can simply uh, basically click down a firewall port that locks all communications only now listening for host identity protocol. Um, under, the co under the covers, this is a Linux kernel. Uh, we run this on Raspberry Pis and built an entire network out of it. We've embedded this into IP cameras. We've worked with Siemens and their rugged comm line of switches now offers this as a uh, an offering. We're talking to almost every industrial control system manufacturer right now to embed this into things like PLCs, PLCs and HMIs so that when they show up, you have the option, do I want to speak TCP IP or do I want to speak HIP? Um, and uh, we're working with medical device companies and things like that as well because those devices should not 
you know, uh, speak the language of the internet. It's crazy. So um, you're going to see a lot about HIP. Um, when I started F5 Networks uh, in 2001, nobody knew what load balancing was, and now there's you know, 10, 20 companies doing it. The same thing's happening here. Uh, we were the first company to commercialize this protocol and this technology, but there will be many to follow. Um, and, uh, and if I didn't make this clear, this will run over any network. So as long as there's a network in place, you could build private networks across any existing network. So the um, next thing I get to show you is something we've, d we've been on development on for two years. We finally released it last week. Uh, and it is called HIP Relay. Um, it is magic, basically. Uh, <laughs> uh, HIP Relay uh, basically is a technology that you put out somewhere on the internet or somewhere that is routable. And I'll have a slide that kind of details more of this in a second. But basically, now I can do non-routable to non-routable behind firewalls without breaking encryption and without changing anything and everything is uh, on the firewalls and everything's encrypted all the way through. So I can take industrial control systems devices and have them talk to somebody who's sitting anywhere in the world without breaking encryption. Um, it is truly uh, magic and it's taken, it took us a few years to really um, not only figure this out but, but uh, make it work at scale. So. Um, and let's start with the de uh, devices up top. So I've got hip switches kind of living on both sides of a firewall. Now, let's say these were IPsec devices or any sort of VPN. Um, to get them to talk is impossible. Once they're behind the firewall, the whole idea is you can't talk to things outside unless you've been whitelisted to do so. Well, to get them to talk, I now have to do what's called punching holes in firewalls, which pretty much everybody does. So I punch holes in firewall, my firewall, and I have to NAT, or network address assassination, to a public routable address to get them to communicate to each other. And people have to do this on both sides. And firewall people hate this, but everybody does it. You, there's really no way around this. You've got to do something like that to get them to talk. Well, with HIP Relay, we put this out in the cloud in the uh, example on the top or off of a uh, DMZ here in the bottom. And as long as those devices can go outbound, just like you sitting at your office can go outbound to your, say, your bank or wherever to make that connection, they'll create statefulness at the firewall. And then the policy within the conductor basically says, if this hip switch and this hip switch cannot see each other, or cannot ping, go to my relay or relays, you can have several if you want. And they'll shotgun blast all the relays and the one that replies the fastest wins, fastest path, and then it makes the connection. But now I can take two devices that would never be able to communicate to each other, I can have them communicate to each other over the internet without breaking encryption and without doing any changes on my firewall. So while this sounds like, oh, no big deal, that has never happened until two weeks ago. Uh, we showed this to a Verizon executive and he said two things. One, congratulations, you broke the internet. Two, <laughs> uh, my APN business, which is their, what they do for, to sell to companies to privatize it, has just disappeared. Because the device on the right can be on Verizon, the device on the left can be on AT&T and they will route to each other. Verizon spends $200 million a year to make sure that never happens. And big carrier grade NAP firewalls. So, um, this is revolutionary. It's, uh, it's not, not been easy to do, but we figured it out. Now, the example on the bottom is probably more common in industrial environments where I have a user, maybe a vendor, maybe you, somebody, who needs to get into my industrial control environment. And now I can bring them all the way in without breaking encryption, without doing any changes on the firewall, right to that device. And what's, in, what's different about HIP than a VPN, because sometimes people will get this confused, VPNs are your device to my network, or your network to my network. And then it's up to me, when you show up on my network, to ACL and VLAN and firewall me down so that I can only talk to that one thing that you want me to talk to. And most people don't go through the trouble to write all those rules, especially if it's, you know, oh, I need a quick fix or I just need somebody to come look at something. HIP is device to device, or what we call host to host. It says you and your cryptographic identity can talk to this machine. That's it. So it's very specific on what you can talk to. So this kind of wraps up my presentation. Um, 
Uh, we offer like this on a variety of software. We're constantly coming out with new software. Like I said, this is going to be started getting embedded into a lot of places. We're based in Seattle, um, so anybody who's interested in learning more about this technology or what we're doing, uh, uh, look us up at temperednetworks.com and you guys have my contact information. Um, and so I think uh, for the video portion, that will probably wrap us up. Um, and there is more if you want to learn more about HIP. Um, there's lots of reading materials. You can Google this stuff. It's all over the internet. So thank you very much, and uh, I'll take your questions after this. So you're both a hardware and a software company. Yep. We're, we're really a software company that sells hardware out of um, uh, necessity, right? Because I, you cannot run our software yet on your PLCs. Right? In fact, any PLC today will not allow for third-party software, for the most part. There might be exceptions to that rule, but for the most part, that's the way it's written. So you kind of need something to have a, the software right on. But at the core, we're really a software company that has developed some hardware. Yeah. And it's open standard, so other companies are going to be offering this over yes. time. Yeah, so Cisco's the biggest viewer of our website. <laughs> Explain. So, one of the things we're being recorded. Oh, okay. So, Sorry. Are we doing? Are you recording the Q and A too? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So, is there a way to? Can you like issue credentials on the fly and then revoke them? Or yes. Like that? Good question. So, on, I can show you on my screen. We can kind of gather around because I unfortunately can do because uh, uh, the connection here. But yes, within the conductor, you can revoke somebody uh, instantly based on either a manual thing like this person's dead to me now, or through software. So the conductor runs an open API. So within the conductor, you, you, your Palo Alto firewall, checkpoint, whatever technology you've got for security can say, that host is compromised. And it's an instant kill switch. Or I can change the network. So I can say, well, this host is compromised, so I'm going to let them talk to all my forensics tools. They're no longer talking to the rest of my network. They're only going to talk to the forensics tools. But take this a step further is that, um, we're going, uh, we're starting to work with some of the big banks because the banks want to be able to say, you call your bank and say, hey, my phone was stolen. And they go, great, we revoke your phone. So there's no username and password they're revoking. What they're revoking is your identity. Same thing for laptops, right? Employee calls up, says, hey, my laptop's been stolen. I've revoked it from the network. The user and, pay, user and passwords that were on there for our systems now no, are lo, no longer m meaningful. Because without that cryptographic identity, even if you have all the credentials in the world, there's still no way past the front door. And if you were to start without having any of this, yeah. just for argument, it's like a simple scenario. Yeah. How long would it take to go from zero to running, including training and all that? Two days. So most of the time when we go in and do these deployments, um, the hardest part is just the um, finding out what talks to what. <laughs> I know that sounds silly, but you go into uh, some of these industrial environments and they're, they get kind of nervous when you put something in that now blocks everything because they go, I don't know what all of this talks to, even though they should, uh, especially in a bigger company. Um, so that usually that's more on their part. But once we show up and we're just plugging stuff in, we can plug these in in what we call transparent mode, which basically makes them a wire. They aren't doing anything. They're just passing traffic. So that makes so, that, yeah, yeah, we can pass traffic, things are good. And then we set all our policies and then we put them into protected mode and then everything disappears. Um, so um, that's, but you know, it depends on the environment, obviously. You know, some companies are multi-states or international and that might take longer, but you know, generally two to three days. Training for us, you could become an expert at this in about a day of training, but if you don't have a lot of IT background, maybe two or three days. Uh, we do a lot of business in Alaska for that reason. It's really hard to keep IT people in Alaska. They usually stay for 20 years or one winter, and there's no like mid, mid between. Like people go up there and like, oh, I love this, or they're like, I can't do this. This is crazy. So um, uh, they, a lot of companies up there uh, like it because a new person can start and in a day or two. They're an expert at the system. Um, they don't have to. Not a lot of training required. But good questions. What other questions do you guys have? And just feel free to go for it, because there's no bad questions. So when the encryption gets broken yes. at AES 256. Great question. Yeah, what, what, what then, right? 
Yeah. yeah. So um, <clears throat> certain governments will require us to give them the encryption keys. So if you go, say, ship this equipment to India or Saudi Arabia or there's lots of companies, uh, c countries like this, once that uh, equipment has been um, shipped, uh, they require the keys. The hip handshake only happens between public private key, public private key once. From there on out, every other handshake is a hash off of the original handshake. So it's a hash based on the cryptographic keys that were participating in that network. So unless you're there for that split second, there's no way to get in, even if you had the encryption keys. So in a hip world, right, um, the, the, the key management doesn't become such a big deal. Now, for certain customers, even with that knowledge, they still want to be their own certificate authority. They say, you know, Temper Networks, your technology is awesome, but I want to run my own certificate authority for our network. And in the conductor, you just, you know, specify your own CA and you can be your own CA. But um, even in that world, you can't get in. Now, uh, <laughs> I was presenting at a, a cybersecurity conference in Washington, D.C., and a gentleman who used to be the head of the N NSA basically, in a polite term, said, son, nothing's impossible. <laughs> I've seen it all, but you're right, HIP is it's, it's the hardest to break into, and there's a reason that they use it. Um, another just fun story, um, I was sitting at work about a year and a half ago, phone rings, and this guy says, hey, uh, what time are you open until? That's a weird question. I don't get that very often at any company I've worked for in the past. So I said, I don't work for Best Buy, right? So I said, well, I'll be here till five. And he goes, great. I need to come by and buy some hip switches. Click. Uh, that's weird. The guy pulls up, come, uh, and it comes and makes a sign, go into a conference room. We sign an NDA, so I won't tell you his name. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and he says, uh, when the history books are written, it's very possible I built the first AI. Well, that's fascinating. Okay. What does your AI do? Well, my AI trades stocks 24 hours a day. Cool. And for the purposes of making money? Yes. Cool. Why did you call us? Well, I worked for the NSA for 22 years as a mathematician. HIP is the only protocol the U.S. government has not backdoored. Everything else that we use on the internet has backdoors all the way through it. But because we're the only users of HIP at this point in the US military, putting a backdoor in it would be shooting ourselves in the foot. So it's the only protocol I trust to make sure that this some foreign government is not backing door into my communications and figuring out my algorithm. Perfect. So he wrote us a check for $43,000. We loaded a bunch of equipment in his car. I've never seen him since. <laughs> It's a weird day. <laughs> uh, but yeah, good question. Yeah. What else? Things that... So support-wise, you have a global organization. Yep. But about 110 employees right now. We're growing at uh, probably add another 90 in the next year. Um, you know, offer 24 by 7 support. Um, you know, this stuff is very straightforward. It works or it doesn't. We don't get a lot of support calls for, you know, a device that all of a sudden went down. It's 99% of the time just misconfiguration. Our biggest support thing is actually that people just plug it in the wrong port. It sounds silly, but, you know, you give two people two ports, they'll plug it in the wrong one and think, oh, there's something broken. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, it, but we yes, we do have a global support organization, and 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 really good. All of our developers and all of our engineering staff is here, based in Seattle. Um, there is uh, we have support people kind of spread around, but all the engineers are here. So are you talking to like Rockwell, for example? Yes, we're Rockwell and Compass Partner. Um, uh, I, I was uh, just last week speaking in Calgary at one of their big events. Um, uh, but yeah, are yeah. They so looking to hip they are looking. Yes, it, it is a pr as you know in this world. It's no one moves that fast. You show, <laughs> right? Um, you know they're still talking about well the, we moved to Ethernet. You know that was 16 years ago, right? So, uh, but yeah. So uh, the, we are a Rockwell partner. Um, we are talking to lots of those types of companies about putting this into their firmware um, because the, at its core, this should really be written into the applications into the firmware. And you know I have a dream, right? It's a small dream. It's kind of silly. 
probably bet uh, it's mine, so I can keep it. Uh, that someday I'll be able to go on Amazon and buy an IP camera and say, IP camera, you can talk to my phone and my wife's phone. That's it. I shouldn't have to write a firewall rule, put a VLAN, and write an ACL at my house to protect people from going backdooring into my IP camera. But that is what I have to do today, just to protect my home. It's crazy, and the world doesn't work that way. Most 99.9% .9 of people could never do that. So, you know, it, security should be that simple. Authentication, encryption uh, should be part of at, at the host level. Uh, but we've kind of this protocol has been around for so long that I think everyone's just going, well, that's the way of the world, and, and so we're just going to deal with it. So, um, so is that seven to one ratio a good one to just keep in mind that, that doing it the way we do it today is seven times more difficult than doing it with this? I think it's very fair. I mean, it's it's a, it's a data sample, but yeah, I think that's what it, it. And it's it's not just the efficiency, but then complexity introduces risk. Um, we, I was recently at a customer site and they had three, just under 3,000 firewall rules. And a lot of those were written in the last 10 years at some point. They don't know, they, you know, going through that in line by line, nobody has that time. They're growing fast business, you know. So the, the, prob the problem is, is that, you know, a lot of things will get left open in those kind of scenarios when you're dealing with complex environments. So it's not just efficiency, but yes. Um, and the other question I get a lot is, well, why do I need a firewall? Well, today, I only have three people that have done this soup to nuts, where they've put HIP in every nook and cranny of their organization. Pretty much everybody else is doing a subset of their organization behind HIP. Um, I do think that the sort of idea of the perimeter and then the internal being, uh, uh, you know, sort of the safe zone is sort of going away over, as time evolves, but most people still, need, I mean, almost everybody still needs a firewall today to, to safely work on any sort of thing. And, and again, we're not the cure-all for security, but we, I think we raised the bar really high. Cool. So do you ever see the switch as a replacement for a firewall? Someday, yeah. Well, we, like as an example, we do not have firewalls at our office. But we eat our own dog food. We call it AlpoNet. <laughs> it's part of it's just testing. But yeah, I mean, you know, the, 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 the idea that the moat was, the, 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 you know, you're going to build the castle wall and then there would be that moat and then you could have everything on the inside and the world would be great. If that worked, we. You know, the world would uh, not be talking about cybersecurity almost every week in the way that it is, because everybody's done that. Um, I, I, it works in a, uh, it works to a certain extent, but it also is, it presents more challenges. And, and a lot of the challenges are just that everybody now has free reign to go out and do all sorts of things. And, and the other problem is this yeah. this is a hot spot, you know? Um, how does HIP or this approach handle it, like in the, in the Stuxnet scenario where somebody, bypasses an air gap with a USB key and the infection's actually on the inside but then it, or in the case of ransomware as well, right? Yeah. It's inside, now it needs to reach out. Right. So how does this so good question. So HIP is a deny all protocol. If you put anything behind a HIP switch, it will not do anything until you have authenticated it and then told it what to do. Like think like the early days of network access control. Um, so so that, um, in that world, there's no way to call out to command and control because you're not whitelisted to do so. So it won't do anything until you've explicitly told it what to do. Uh, so, um, but, 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 <laughs> we do not prevent somebody from sticking a USB in their machine and infecting their ICS network with ransomware because we have no idea what you're doing. Right, no, I understand. Yeah. That, but the way I see it is, okay, so somebody has it, they stick it into something, it gets infected. Yes. But the only way it becomes ransomware is if it can reach out to the internet. That's to correct. That server and then encrypt the traffic with the ransomware. You got it. Is, right? Yeah. So even though, yes, internally, you got a mess. Yeah. agree, and wouldn't think that this would do anything to solve that. Right. But what it does do is it prevents the important part, which is going and getting the encryption control. part from the you, ransomware, right? It yes. It locks you down. That's exactly right. Um, and most times, people build small-scale HIP networks. These networks, uh, if I was able to show you a demo, and I could show you guys a demo uh, after this, is that um, they're, they're very separate and isolated from each other. So if I build, uh, say, an um, IP camera network, and then I build a SCADA network, they will never see each other, just like if I built two physical networks. 
So most people, because it's so easy to do this, because you just go literally click, 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 uh, that they build small networks so that if something happens, it only happens in this isolated network. It's not hitting all of my systems. It's happening in a, in a small subset of systems. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that, it's a challenge. And, and the, the ransomware thing is not going away. And whether it, we like it or not, that is our new reality because there's just way too much money in it. What happens if the if switches lose connectivity to the conductor? Great question, because I usually talk about this earlier. Uh, so the uh, conductor and the HIP switches, um, when they designed this, they separated the data plane from the control plane. So that if the conductor was to go offline for any reason, whatever you told a hip switch to do, it would do forever until the end of time, until it gets new instruction. So you can't do changes. You can't collect logs, right? Because the hip switches, uh, you know, have so much memory on it, and we'll, you know, we'll store logs for 30 days, but then you know they can't keep them forever. Um, but if you give a hip switch a job and then you lose the conductor, it'll do that until the end of time. Uh, I have two customers, they're both in the nuclear uh, industry, that will set policy on their hip switches and then physically unplug their conductor because it represents an attack surface, right? If I get to the conductor, it's a very bad day. Now, the same could be true if I get to your firewall or your routers or your domain system, right? If I had to log into those. So today the conductor does speak TCP IP because we, need, we needed to enable people to be able to manage this from anywhere. So people will put this on a physical server, They'll run it in VMware, or they'll put it up in Amazon. And there's no bad answer, or, or Azure. And there's no real bad answer here. You can put it anywhere you want. It depends on the deployment, what makes the most sense. Um, but uh, future versions, which you know, probably for us is six to nine months away, will have the option to say, I only am going to listen for HIP. So now these three folks are the only people that can get to the conductor. Yeah. Do you support a redundant implementation of your HIP switch? So when yes. you're down at the control level, Yep, so we, the hip switches can be redundant. Um, we have failover capabilities. Um, and then we have swapping abilities as well. So uh, on the, the small ones, because it would be kind of ridiculous. I've got one here in my bag. So on these little guys, right, um, uh, people will put a spare on the shelf. And if this died, they have a 50 year mean time between failure, but you know, it's electronics, they happen. Um, you can go uh, swap with the one on the shelf and all the policies will swap and then you plug the new one in. So in the little ones, you do that. On the big ones, they have data center grade that have redundancy. The conductor can have a failover, failover, failover. You have three conductors that are just active failover, failover. Um, but for the most part, most, like 95% of our customers just have their one conductor. And they just back it up nightly, just like anything else. What happens to their network, though, if there is a catastrophic loss of the building where the conductor is? It can, so the network remains intact, nothing, they're just un, unable to change, to do changes on that network. So the network just would flow forever until the conductor comes back online and starts giving them new instructions. Um, when hip switches first come online, they, you could do nothing with them except tell them where the conductor is. That's it. And then once the conductor, they check in with the conductor, there's a key exchange that's done and now that hip switch and that conductor are going to be, you know, pretty much married to each other moving forward. Uh, our, sort of our mid-sized to larger customers now, when they order hip switches, they're giving us the IP address of their conductor. So when this shows up, it just phones home, and they don't have to deal with uh, you know, configuring it locally to have it phone home. Um, and this way, especially companies that are international or even just you know, have offices, they don't really need to tell the operator at that, that office what this is and explain to how to operate it. They just say, get it on the network. Once it's on the network, it shows up in the conductor, and then whoever's managed the conductor can basically start building networks. What happens if your conductor fails? So, say, I understand it goes offline, but let's just say, yeah. for whatever reason, it blows up. Yeah. How do the hip switches then? So yeah, so we have so we have a back, you could set automatic backups every day. And then some crazy reason you forgot to do that. Um, the, the only option now is to go to each hip switch and do a factory reset back to zero, and then introduce it to a new conductor, um, which is a, would be a very painful process. So hopefully that would be a lesson learned, and we wouldn't do that. But yes, yeah, you can set automatic backups in the conductor, just like so it's still less painful than the network build was in the first place. That's right. <laughs> Conductors is a software package. I mean, at the end of the day, this is just Linux software running too on, on devices, right? So it's all software under the hood for sure. And you sell a conductor or like a 
license it? Uh, both. So you can buy a physical conductor and then license it up, or you can just license it and uh, in like say VMware or in um, Amazon or Azure. And in both, it, t it costs about 35 bucks a month to run in an Azure environment. So not much from a compute standpoint. And you just add licenses as you grow the number of HIP services that you manage. And so the HIP services for us are HIP switches, HIP clients, and you know uh, virtual HIP switches. So if I'm a, a sort of an engineer that's busily working on lots of systems, yep. I can say give client A a treatment plant over here in his central engineering department a HIP. Yep. And then let me in too. Sure. Meanwhile, I got a brand new client over here. Uh huh. And I want to get to be on the that one. Yep. And provide support. And so yep. I can just build that out. That's right. Yeah, so you could just build little tiny islands of communication that these things can talk to these things. And each hip switch has the ability to do firewalling on the inside of the tunnel. So uh, on a per hip switch basis, you can say this device can talk to this device over this port and protocol. So most of our customers don't because uh, it starts adding complexity into the equation, except for the ones that run a lot of cellular. So we sell hardware sw hip switches. Um, uh, uh, like that guy in the far left in the corner there uh, with the antennas off of it, and you can drop a SIM card into it and run over AT&T or Verizon or T-Mobile or any of those. Um, and so they'll do it to reduce the chattiness on their network uh, and lower their data bill. But for the most part, people don't do firewall on these, but you can. Um, we also now have the ability to do um, HTTP get and then uh, ping behind us and, and then set policy and alerts for that. So if I'm pinging a device behind me and then all of a sudden it goes offline, I can send alerts, I can fail over sites, I can do certain different things. It was our first sort of walk into this world. Eventually we're going to do device-based fingerprinting so we'll know a lot more about the device behind us. Um, uh, those type of things like what OS, what, you know, uh, all sorts of fun stuff. So um, there's more of that coming. But yeah, so uh, good question. Is there any uh, practical limit to the number of uh, addresses on the whitelist? So addresses, no. There's no practical limit. We run a slash 32 host on every hip switch. Uh, so from a routing perspective, in theory, you couldn't have more than 5,000 devices behind a hip switch one hip switch, um, uh, but uh, we get wonky, meaning things start getting weird, at about 9,000 hip services under one conductor. So um, that's up, uh, the first version of this, we were about 700 devices and things would start getting weird. Uh, we just moved to a new uh, database uh, um, uh, and uh, called IFMAP2. Um, it was originally IFMAP1, but IFMAP2. And IFMAP2, we could do 9,000 HIP services under one conductor. From a device standpoint right now, it's pretty much limitless. Um, and we're, you know, we're, I think the future of this is, you know, conductor as a service, people just spinning up conductors and, you know, putting lights. I mean, you, we're kind of doing that now, but you, you do have to get your own Amazon instance. You know, we'll help you get stuff in there. Um, uh, but uh, there's no just, I go to a website, click, 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 I can spin up a conductor. That's coming. We're, we're eventually going to get there because get, we get asked about it. You know, local, small water districts or, or small contracting firms want to just be able to build you know, their own quick conductor, do it in a few minutes, maybe buy a couple switches on the internet and, start, you know, and be done, right? So um, that type of service will be coming as well. Yeah, it's cool stuff. I love my job. <laughs> <laughs> so how does this play with, so there's a couple that like, seems to be growing where you've got the AI, you know, like the, what are they called? They're out of Cambridge, England. I um, can't remember their name right now. But anyway, basically yep. they just monitor your network. Traffic. Yeah, like Dark Trace. Exactly. That's yep. What so yeah. how does Dark Trace or a product like that, I mean, does it just... You have to whitelist it in or else it's going to see encrypted traffic. Okay. Right. So you can do something like that. You can whitelist it in. And you can whitelist anything you want in. Yeah. So that's kind of the beauty of it, right? So um, uh, whether it's dark trace or, or solar winds uh, for monitoring or yeah. anything like that, to be you want you know you, you still want to be able to get that because sometimes people will look at this and go, well, this is all great, but 
you're now hiding things from me, and that's never presents another problem, right? So right. you still need visibility. And into the conductor itself, you do have, you know, uh, health information. Of the, you know, you can run TCP dump. You can do all these things. Uh, you, know, you can set alerts for, uh, you know, uh, if you see certain things. So we do have monitoring built in, but it's very basic, you know, to get like a dark trace or those type of things. You would want to do that. But the other thing that's interesting is that uh, we had a customer that took their IPS sensor and moved it from at the edge of their network to behind hip switches. And his description I thought was really cool, right, which is when I got my IPS, it was kind of like when I got my dog. It would bark at everything that walked past the network. And so I was getting all these false alarms all the time, and after a while I started becoming numb to it, realizing that, yeah, 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 this is the mailman, or it's just, you know, some email traffic or whatever, but it's not an attack. But now I've got my IPS sensors behind hip switches. And now when the dog barks or my IPS goes off, someone's in my house, right? It's a different thing. I know it's not just perimeter traffic or something anomaly. They, I've, got, I've likely got a problem and I've got to investigate it, right? Because someone got in somehow in a network where things should be getting in. So um, yeah, I, I think we're going to start seeing some more partnerships with some of the next gen uh, uh, you know, IPS providers and firewall guys to get their sensors either built into the hip or behind us so that, you know, um, uh, it lowers the amount of uh, noise that you get from your, your uh, sort of monitoring solutions. But, um, you know, when you do get an alert, you got to pay attention. Cool. Any other questions? Hmm. You guys are going to kill the relevance of the TV show, Mr. Robot. <laughs> I love that show. <laughs> Just because it's, you know, things I talk about they were doing, even if it was acting in history. But yes, I, I agree. <laughs> Yeah, it would be a, the world would be a very boring place, and and you know I'll be honest. Part of our challenge was speed. And it still is actually. Um, I was at uh, uh, I can't say the name of the company, but a company out in Redmond, software company, and I started doing my thing, and the guy goes 40 gig or 100 gig, and I said three gig, and he literally walked out of the room. He just goes, okay, well, I just walked out, and I went, where do you go? And he goes, well, I think he thinks you're too slow, which you know, okay, that's fine, but um, when I started. The fastest appliance we ran ran 100 megabits a second. That same appliance does you know, close to four gigs of traffic today. We're using a pretty heavy out, uh, encryption, and we're doing it all in software. We don't have any ASICs. We don't have any of our own custom chips or anything like that yet. We're just doing all this processing in software and using Intel chips. Um, so you can only get that so fast without doing some crazy sort of you know, rebuilds of, of, of just uh, encryption. So. Um, but that is part of our challenge, right? A Google or anybody would not necessarily be able to adopt this at grand scale quite yet just because of the challenges you have with this level of encryption. Um, so, but we'll get there, right? We all know it's, it's just a matter of time. We're already in development of a 40 gig switch. It's just probably be a year or more before we're publicly announced or, you know, showing it uh, to, to off. But yeah, we've started development on it. My plants go real slow. <laughs> yeah, most do. Most <laughs> most skate. Yeah, this is why the you know industrial systems market I think has really embraced this. Medical devices also um, not a lot of heavy traffic. Not you know 4K video or anything like that. But you get into some of these bigger environments, speed definitely becomes a challenge. So cool. Well, thank you guys very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>